our series on what's wrong with us. So if, if, if it's your first time here in CCF Eastwood or any CCF churches, uh, we'd like to invite, let you know that we are in a series called What's Wrong With Us. It's an overview on the book, on the topic of um, uh, the book of the first Corinthians. It's Paul's letter to the people, the church in Corinth, right? And this, this amazing book, the first Corinthians, this first letter to the, the people in Corinth, is, is an amazing book that uh, eerily captures the relevance of the concerns of the people today. You know, even though this letter was written over 2,000 years ago, it's so relevant because most of the problems that the book, the people in the church in Corinth have experienced, which they are unloading to Paul, is actually certain things that we are also experiencing nowadays. And so what blesses me in this ongoing series is that it tells us what's wrong with us, but also it tells us how to make it right. You know, and we provide a solution for that through God's word. And tonight will be a continuation of our series as we go into two chapters. We're going to hit two chapters today, 37 verses. So chapter 8 and chapter 9. And my prayer is that uh, as we go through chapter 8 and chapter 9, we will allow you, the Lord will speak to all of you and allow you to listen and understand more of His Word. And now we could address the things that are wrong inside of us that we are not perhaps aware of, or perhaps for some who we are aware of, but the beauty of God's word is that is a means for us to be transformed to his image and likeness. So if I'm going to go right off the bat and tell you what chapter 8 is all about, I could put it as it's a gray book. I, I say a gray book because chapter 8 of the first book of Corinthians talks about this what we call a gray area. The gray area in the life of the believers in Corinth. A gray area for some of you that might not be familiar, is an ill-defined situation. It's a situation where it's not clearly defined. It exists somewhere there in between black and white. And in the two positions that are in the extreme side of a gray area situation is something that we all do need to manage. The problem when we are, so, we are placed in a gray area is that the extremes you know, that will push us is something that we don't want to be part of. Okay, let me repeat. A gray area is something that is not defined. What is something that is defined? One thing that is defined the Bible is, like for example, there's many things that are defined in the Bible. But one thing that is defined in the Bible is the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments is defined. One, two, three, four, five. This is this is thing. But there are certain things that are happening in the Christian setting right now that is not actually a specific situation that's being addressed in the Bible. So that's what we call the gray area. The problem with gray area is that it might lead you to extremes, like what I said. The first extreme is that it could lead to legalism. What is legalism? Legalism is the denial that there is something that is gray. A legalist will only see things with black and white. As such, his actions or her actions will be only those that are permitted in Scripture. If the Bible specifically doesn't say anything about that, automatic wrong na po yun. On the flip side of gray areas are people that on the other side, which is the side of licentiousness, being licentious, meaning it also denies the concept of gray and everything that is forbidden in the, everything in the Bible that is not forbidden is actually okay. So two extremes. Extremes that we are going to need to tackle because these are certain things that's happening in the church today. I'm seeing blank faces, so let me explain to you more what a gray area is. A gray area is something like this. Should I drink alcohol when I am in a Christian wedding? That's a gray area. Alcoholism or, being, or, or alcohol per se is a gray area because the Bible says it's not wrong to get to, to, to drink, but it's wrong to get drunk, right? But there are people in between that, that says, no, 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 alcohol is extremely wrong. Hindi yan pwede. And there's also on the flip side says that alcohol, pwede yan. And so it's confusing. Another confusing part is, as a Christian, as a born-again Christian, is it okay to go to bars or lounges? Or in my time, it's called the discos. Okay? So, okay ba ako mag-disco, mag-disco? Pwede ba ako mag-disco kung kristyano ako? I mean, these are really questions that are left unanswered because the Bible is, is quiet in that. What about watching violent movies with your kids in the family? Another question. Or playing violent games in, in, ano, in, 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 in video games. Ano ba yan? Bawal ba yan? Ano ba sabi sa Bible niyan? What about 
you know, certain things over the years that have been debated on in church. What to wear? What to wear in the beach? What to wear in the gym? Or even what to wear in service? Alam nyo, pinag yan? There are people debating on that because the Bible is silent on it. Even luxury items. What type of music do you, do you listen to? Hard rock music, heavy metal. Sin ba yon? Sin ba mag- makinig ng hard rock, heavy metal, and all of these things that the Bible is silent about? So now you get the, er- the idea. That is what a gray area is. By the way, loto. Sama ba yan? Loto? Ano ba? Pag tumataya sa loto. Ano ba yan? Anti-Christian ba yan? Right? Wala sa Bible yan eh. So pwede ba yan? I mean, all of these questions, right? And there are definitely questionable practices, doubtful things among Christians in our culture today. Which is why 1 Corinthians chapter 8, though it does not specifically address these issues, it does gives us a basic principle. A basic principle on how do we address areas that are gray. Things that we do not really comprehend because it's questionable, right? So again, let me repeat for everyone, okay? Let, let read this with me. A doubtful thing or a questionable practice is an act not sinful in itself nor specifically commanded against in Scripture. Yan daw yung gray area. Which a Christian, a believer, is free to do, but which may become sinful for the Christian who's doing it if practiced or abused. Okay? Yan po, kaya medyo maganda to pag nag-uusap natin yung gabi to. It's something that is very relevant to all of us. The reason why it's so relevant is because of this. You know, you question, you ask, how much should I let other people's views control my actions? Ayaw natin makontrol ang actions natin. Ayaw natin pinagsasabihan tayo eh. Because we, we, when we know it's right, we want to do it. But the problem is there are people who tell us, hey, must I limit my freedom, my rights, for this narrow, more restricted, legalistic Christian? Tarigyan na ba yun? Yeah? Masyado kang legalistic. Hindi ko pwede, ba't ko ba gagawa? Right? So right off the bat, you recognize that there is a problem about gray areas in every Christian. And this is what exactly chapter 8 is all about. Another compelling question to us is this. How much should I adjust my actions? How much? Well, the answer to this question, and I'm claiming that the reason why you're here, here in church is because you want to understand God's word. I'm claiming and I'm believing in faith. The reason why you're here is because you want to obey God. And if you want to obey God, God has a principle when we are in these areas, which scriptures will tell us more about. You see, when we talk about certain things that the Bible is silent on, it has to be addressed and discussed elaborately because certain things will get missed. Because when you decide certain things that is not in the Bible, it is subject to interpretation. A lot. And that's why you need to be guided. You need to understand how to discuss. And so there's no clear cookie cutter answer to each of, of these gray areas. And that's why I submit to you, there needs to be a principle. Okay, are you ready? May principio. Ang principio po, the principle that needs to come into, this, come into play when we're addressing questionable situations in this principle. Are you ready? And which is the title of our message today. All right, one, two, three. Can you please all read this? Oh, parang malungkot kayo nung yun yung principle. Parang ayaw nyo isurrender ang right nyo. One more time, one more time. What's the message for today? Surrender your rights. And how do you do that? How do you surrender your rights? Well, there are going to be three outlines that I'm going to share to you that will encompass, will cover the two chapters that we will talk about tonight. And these outline three points are simple. Number one, we surrender our hearts, our, our rights, because we want to build others up. That's the first point. The reason why you're surrendering your rights. By the way, what is your right? What do you mean right? What are your rights? You have the right to be happy. You have the, you have the right to, be, to live a convenient life. You have the right to practice liberty in your faith. You have the right to be able to get and to buy what you want. You have the right to behave in a way that is conducive to your situation. So there are so many different rights that you have. But tonight, we're going to talk about surrendering those rights in order to what? Number one, build others up. Number two, protect others. And number three, for the gospel, which is the most important part. And since we have a lot of ground to, off, ground to cover this evening, these two chapters are to, uh, have about around 37 verses. 
mahaba. Hindi tayo matatapos ng 9 o'clock, okay? Lalagpas tayo. So, kailangan ko i-summarize. Kailangan ko po i-summarize so that we will be able to finish by 7.15. Okay? Kinabahan yung mga tao. Hanggang 9 o'clock ba itong service na ito? Nakita ko yung mukha eh. Oh, 9 o'clock? Hindi po. Hanggang 7.30 lang po tayo tonight. Uh, Sisiguraduhin natin na makakapag-dinner pa kayo ngayong gabing to. Okay? Okay po ba yan? Alright, so let's go right to it. What's the background? What is happening in chapter 8? What's happening in chapter 8 is this. The Apostle Paul is dealing with the subject of doubtful questionable practices. And in the case of the Corinthians, it's meat. Karne. It's the meat being offered to idols. Yun po ang pinag-uusapan in chapter 8. And Paul's conclusion in chapter 8 is that a Christian has the liberty to eat the meat. Pwede mong kainin ng karne na yan. Pinag-aawain, kakainin ba yung karne o hindi? Na sinasacrifice idols. By the way, when I speak in Tagalog, is there anyone here who do understand Tagalog? I mean, this is a serious question. Meron ba dito ang di malunong magtagalog? Okay. Good? Everybody good? Okay, so pwede ako magtagalog. Alright? Okay. Pero hindi naman ako tagalog kasi nagtagalog na ako ng 3 p.m. Ubus na po yung tagalog ko. So but just in case, kailangan ko magtagalog, magtagalog po ako. Anyway, going back. Paul's conclusion was, it's okay to eat the meat, but it will become a sin. This, this is the key. It's okay to eat it, but it will become a sin if the eating of the meat will cause a brother who is weak in his conscience to sin. Let me repeat. This is the principle. Your behavior, even though it's right, in your mind, in the context of scriptures, it's right, but in, because it's gray area, but because of your actions, someone who is a lesser, more immature believer, a newer believer in Christ, is stumbling, is committing a sin, then what you're doing, even though you think it's not a sin, is actually a sin. Do you follow? Naintindihan niyo po ba yung, yung prinsipyo? Okay, kung hindi niyo po intindihan, mayroon pa po akong 45 minutes to discuss this further with you to understand that principle. But the king key is here. He's pointing out, Paul's going to point out in chapter 8, that the mature believer, the mature brother, the much more mature sister should set aside that liberty, that freedom, that right, so that a more immature sister or brother, a more perhaps a baby Christian, will not be able to stumble or be a hindrance to his growth. More importantly, when you set aside your rights, you need to set aside in the platform of love. You know, you will never help a brother, you will never help out a, a sister when you want to correct, you want to use your knowledge without embracing it in the platform of love. And that's why for you to be able not to stumble, a person not to stumble, you need to enable that person to grow up and understand the grace of God, which chapter 8 will be talking about. Also, Paul will discuss that the strong brother is not to insist upon his rights. It's what I was telling you earlier. Giving up that which is all right to practice, which is right to practice for the unity of the body of Christ. There are certain things that you have to forego. Your right, your right to be heard, your right to be said something because you want to protect the unity of the body of Christ. Which is why I love this statement. Love causes the Christian to forego liberties, privileges, and rights. He will never let go of that. Because if you're not going to concentrate on the concept of love, pag wala kang love, you will instill your right. Pag walang love, uunahin mo sarili mo. Kung walang love, you will forego unity. Kung walang love, you will not pursue, even though you have the right knowledge. So it is an important principle that we need to grasp this morning, that this is what we need to do. By the way, when I talk about love, and foregoing liberties. I am very careful because there are certain things that we do nowadays in our world that is done for love, but it's done blindly. Meaning, alam mo nang mali, gagawin mo pa. No, that's not what I'm talking about here. Scripture is not talking about you foregoing your rights so that you can cancel whatever guidelines or whatever commands Scripture has. An important component for you to understand that this foregoing of our rights have to be in the bounds of moral and spiritual laws. Clearly, you cannot forego your rights to call out sin in the guise of love. Maraming ganun eh. Mahal mo ba ako? Hindi mo napapansinin yan. Pababayaan mo na. Mahal mo eh. Hindi po ganun. There are different parts or kinds of love. There is tough love. 
There is love that corrects. There is a love that suffers. But there's a love which is patient. And there's a love that embraces. Marami po aspekto ang pagmamahal. Pero ito po, kailangan po maintindihan, when we're foregoing our rights, it does not mean that you are going to commit sin. Understood? Importante po ba yan? Kasi baka umuwi kayo ngayon, sabihin nyo, pwede naman pala eh. Love kita eh. So pwede ko nang gawin lahat. Yung sabi ng pastor, hindi po yun. Uh, what I'm telling you is this. This needs to be done in the in the context of spiritual and moral loss. And that's why, in chapter 9, by the way, nakaka-13 nakaka minutes na po ako, nag intro pa lang ako, ha? kasi ginaganda ko po yung intro para mamaya mamadaliin ko na yung 37 verses. Okay? So pag di, ako na, di ko po kayo nakikinig ngayon, baka mawala kayo mamaya. Okay? So importante po, binibigyan ko na ng magandang tour Tinutul ko na po kayo sa mga titignan natin ngayong hapon at gabing ito. Kasi mamaya, bibilis na natin ang takbo. Kasi kailangan tayo mag-dinner ng 7.30. Okay po ba yan? Alright, good. So what I'm doing now is that we're now progressing, moving into the summary of chapter 9. So after Paul defended that what you're doing is correct, eating, eating meat offered to idols is okay, provided that you are not going to Sear the conscience, or you're not, your, your behavior will not affect a brother or a sister in Christ. But when it's affected already, then you need to stop. That's the whole story of chapter 8. And you need to give in to your rights. And so the people in Corinth then asked him in chapter 9, So, if you want to give up our rights, are you giving up your rights, Abigail Paul? Because the entire chapter 9 is about Paul giving those rights. In chapter 9, the Corinthian church has difficulty, you know, setting up aside their rights. But Paul says, no, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to show you what it means to forego your rights. And Paul will rattle off 11 verses of, how, of why he needs to have this right used. But in the culminating part in verse 12, he will say, but I will not use those rights because blah, 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 blah. Suspense muna para mamaya meron pa tayong pag isipan on verse 12. So this is the entire verse 9. You know, chapter 9, sorry. 30 set, by, by today, pag-aaral lang po natin hanggang, chap, hanggang verse 23. Kasi next week, our speaker, uh, who's our next speaker? Carl and Claude will study uh, chapter 9 onwards to chapter 10. But today, we will go about fix, coming into chapter 8, chapter 9. Okay, nakaka-15 minutes na po ako. Baka nakalimutan na natin. Ano po ang title for the message today? Bangaling! Kahit di pa na dinner Memorize lahat! Surrender your rights. That is our main key point today. So let me take you right off what's happening in chapter 8. If you notice, in right off the bat, in chapter 8, the word knowledge or know was mentioned seven times in three verses. Pagka ganun, when you're studying the Bible and you read, verse, when you read certain verses and certain words are being duplicated, a lot of times, just like here in this in this in this in this verse, it me it means that that group of texts, that is the main point, okay. And so here in this text, the main point is knowledge, but there's something about knowledge that Paul wants to call out. Know is the verb. When we when he says we know that we all have knowledge, that means Paul believes without a shadow of doubt that the entire church in Corinth has this knowledge. Why? Why does Paul say this? Because Paul is the one who taught the Corinthian churches. He was the one who established this church for 18 months. He spent time in this church. That's why he knows what they're talking about. But the question that we need to ask is, what is this knowledge all about? What is this knowledge Paul referring to? Well, this knowledge that he's referring to is that there's only one God. And the fact that idols are powerless and worthless. That's what he is saying, that this Corinthian people, some members of the Corinthian church actually know. We, knew, we know that you know that. But the problem is, right? The problem is, some of them, some of these people who have this knowledge is acting as if they know everything. Nakakita na ba kayo ng mga taong ganun? Na nakabasa lang ng mga one or two chapters sa isang libro, pero when they talk, parang nabasa nila yung buong libro, meron ba kayong mga kay kasamang ganun, no? Alam ko, wala dito noon, right? But uh, there are some that perhaps does that. that. A limited knowledge, they speak as if they're the expert in that field. This is what Paul is saying. This is what Paul is warning. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. 
Because the principle here, when you come into a th- in the context of knowledge, there has to be an angle of humility. Let me repeat. The more knowledgeable, the more mature a person is, the more humble he is. Why? Because he knows. He knows that, there's so, that what he knows is lesser than what he does not know. Let me repeat. A person who is really knowledgeable, who has the right knowledge, who is really mature in his walk, understands that because kahit na dami niya ng alam, ang dami pa niya hindi alam. At yung mga hindi niya alam, mas madami yun sa alam niya. And so what he comes into it is the idea of humility. Hindi nagyayabang. And you see this. You see this in CEOs. You, you, you see this in, in leadership that, 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 that is really full of experience. You know, rivers that are quiet runs deep. And this is the same concept that Paul is saying. Why? Because they're becoming arrogant. Yumayabang na po sila sa kanilang kaalaman. And these arrogance are the one impacting the way that they actually are in their relationship with the people in Corinth. That is why it says, you know, here, there are people who knows. He knows that, that, that uh, eating meat offered to idols is okay. There's a group of that. However, there is another group in the church that day that did not understand this truth. Sila yung weak believers. Their conscience bothers them. When, when someone or they themselves eat this meat that has being offered to idols, they are troubled when they see that. And this is where knowledge has to be balanced with love. What Paul is saying, even if you know that eating meat to idols is okay, but by doing that, you're actually affecting someone who has a weaker, more immature walk than you then it is the responsibility of the more mature Christian to adjust and to give up that right. Why? Because that's exactly what God did. When you love God, He is known by Him. Meaning, the reason why you could forego your right is because you know that you love God. And the more you love God, the more you will understand what God has done for you. And what has God done for us? What has God done for us? God has done for us that He sent His Son, His only Son, to come here as God become man, to become a sacrifice, so that you and I can have the forgiveness of our sins. And that is the ultimate expression of His love for us, which makes you and I capable of understanding that it is okay to forgo our rights. I like this. Everybody, can you read this with me? Christian behavior is founded on love, not knowledge. And the goal of the Christian life is knowledge not love. Knowledge that is tempered with love is usually the characteristic of someone with maturity and spiritual growth. Yet there are many believers that have no knowledge. Marami po sa simbahan have the knowledge of God's word and they think they are mature Christians but they struggle with arrogance, with selfishness, selfishness and a lack of love for others. Ergo, demonstrating a immaturity in their lives today. So folks, there's one thing that is important when it comes to knowledge. And that is, your knowledge leads you to understand more of who God is. And the more you know who God is, the more you know what God has done for you, the more you want to love God back in return. That's why the Bible tells us that love builds and love edifies. This is the photo of what that picture is. When a mature believer reaches out to an immature believer, and guides the immature believer because the immature believer is not yet ready for certain things that's happening in his life right now. When spiritual knowledge is used in love, the stronger Christian can take the hand of the weaker Christian and help him to stand and to walk in the freedom in Christ. Let me give you an example. There is a couple, a couple who had a difficult time having a kid, having a child. So it took them a couple of years before. So they, when they had their first child, they wanted to give everything to the child, everything to the child. But when the child became four or five years old, he watched a, a video of a balisong. You know a balisong? You know a switch knife? Uh, switch knife. Uh, switch blade, right? A balisong, right? And so the kid wanted the balisong. He said, Daddy, Daddy, give me the balisong, give me that knife. And and the mature father knows that the immature child will not be able to handle the balisong at this stage in his life. 
And so what did the father do? Even the father loved the child, of course the father did not give the body song to the child. Why? Because even though the father had the right, even though the child had the right to ask, the child is not ready for certain things. And similarly, in our Christian walk, it's like that. May mga bagay na hindi pa tayo ready. Kaya hindi pa po dapat ibigay. Similarly, there are certain Christian actions that we do that other immature Christians will not understand. That's why you have to taper it off. That, you need, that means you need to adjust. You see, the problem is, you could not force feed immature believers and transform them into giants. You can't. Knowledge must be mixed with love. Otherwise, the Christian will end up with what? Big heads. Instead of what? Large hearts. You know my prayer? Can, can I share to you my prayer for this church, for our church, for CCF Eastwood? You know my prayer for church is this. That CCF Eastwood is really known not for its knowledge, but it's for love. That's my prayer. That we will be known as a community that are, is really loving. Not critical, not cynical, not secluded, not isolated, but a church who really loves. Of course, of course, knowledge has to be a part of that. Of course, that's why I stand here. That's why I study God's word for two straight weeks to preach on this topic. Because I want to make sure that what I tell you, what I preach to you, is God's word. Similarly, all the other preachers do that, which is why we're really strong in theology, in the way we want to share God's word. But at the same time, that type of knowledge must be mixed with what? With love. Because if anyone loves God, He is known by Him. And the real test, truly the real test of knowledge is loving God. The person loving God is recognized by Him, by having a real knowledge. That's the test whether we really know something. It's not how the knowledge affects our love towards God, but how this flows to other people. That's why it's so important. So let me ask you this question. What mindset should we have so we can use this knowledge to build others up? What what is our mindset? What should be your mindset so that when you have this knowledge, it's building other people up? Let me share to you a, a, a nice story about how knowledge should be used properly. You see, human knowledge on earth is at best incomplete and partial. What do I mean by that? You can never understand everything. That's for sure. You will never be able to do that. So if you don't know everything, you need to put that into perspective, specifically in this situation. When a stronger brother looks down at a weaker brother for not exercising his Christian liberty. Pag nakatingin ka, ano ka ba naman? Yung idols na idols niya, hindi naman yan totoo. So you could actually eat meat when you're looking down at a younger brother, a weaker brother, or a weaker brother judging a stronger brother for for using and practicing this liberty, he must remember that his knowledge is incomplete. Incomplete, that means we often judge motives and forget that we are unable to grasp the entire situation because the facts are incomplete. Problema, ang simbahan natin ngayon, everyone is this, like this. We jump, we pounce on people by just making one mistake even though we do not understand the entire complexity of things. We judge people by one wrong word, one wrong line that he says or she says, but we don't know the entire life of the same person. How can, we, how can you judge that? Remember, we are not defined, the people, you, us, we are not defined by our mistakes. We are defined by who we are in Christ. And so if you, in your knowledge, which is not only incomplete, but you don't know the entire situation, and when you're solving that, the way for you to do that is to be able to understand truly what's happening first. Get all the information. Let me give you an example in real-life situation. There was a retreat that, uh, for, for in, in, during the pandemic, the retreat for singles stopped for two years. And so back after the pandemic, in 2022, uh, we started back the retreat after two years of a hiatus. And when we came back in the retreat, uh, just for your information, we need to raise funds. You know, we need to raise funds. The target is about probably from roughly about 200,000 to raise funds to fund the retreat. Anyway, to cut the long story short, the, the, the support, the, the, the result of the Sumpo drive was off the roof. More than what we expected. 
totally out of this world number. Okay? And so because of that, we decided, hey, we should thank all these wonderful sponsors who went out of their way to provide funds, food, anything in kind to make our retreat a successful one. So we went out and we produced a video for that, thanking all of them, all these brands, all these sponsors. But when we uploaded that in social media, a sister in Christ reached out to me, not from CCF, and said, hey, why are you commercializing your church? Why are you putting those sponsorships in your social media account? Don't you think that that's going to tarnish the image of CCF and that will make, the C- that will make CCF look as if you're very commercialized? I said, yeah, it can be like that, but you need to understand where I'm coming from. The reason why we're thinking that is not because we want to advertise them. We're putting that because we want to thank them. Thank them for what they did to us. That is the place where we are coming from. And so if you don't understand that because your knowledge is incomplete, instead of being an encouragement, you want to turn it down. You want to tear people down. And I think we have already a lot of that in our world today. So why don't we switch that in our community in CCF Eastwood and make it others-centric to build others up and forego our rights. What's our first point for today? Surrender your rights so that we could what? Build others up. Let's move on to second point. The second point is very straightforward. You do this because you want to protect others. You forego your rights, you surrender your rights because you want to protect others. Paul was doing that. Look, Therefore, concerning the eating of the sacrifice to the idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and there's no God but one. Verse 5, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we exist through Him. Paul is agreeing with the freedom party, that idol is nothing, and there's only one God. Therefore, meat offered to idols can be eaten because that's a Christian liberty. But, but look, even though he agreed, even though he said that that is okay to do, look at what he said in verse 7. However, hindi lahat ng tao, katulad yung mag-isip, referring to the younger believers, perhaps the immature, yung mga bagong Sali lang sa simbahan nila sa Corinth. These people, remember, Corinth is a very, is a city known for its immorality, known for its paganism. Idol worship is part and parcel of life. And so if you were part of that life, siyempre sensitive ka. Hindi ka basta-basta pwedeng kumain lang ng mga karne na, nasa, na bigay doon sa mga idols. And that's why for them, right, for them, not all believers are mature in their knowledge and understanding. Kaya when there's weaker brother ate meat, they think it's already tantamount to idolatry. And so that was what Paul was trying to manage. By the way, did you notice? The more mature believer is the one that has Christian freedom. Pansin niyo ba yan? Eh di ba mga yan, ang tingin natin, ay strong nito kasi napakaligalistik. Oh. Lahat ng mga bagay, ginagawa ng lakasabi sa Bible, strong na strong ng faith nito. Ano, ano, ano. It's actually different. The stronger believer is the one that can enjoy his Christian freedom, her Christian freedom, provided that that freedom does not get into the way of other people's faith and growth. Look, food will not condemn us to God. We are neither worse if we eat nor better when we do eat. You know, I have one of the most common questions that are being asked with me when it comes to eating food is dinugoan. People think that eating dinugoan is bad, is sinful, right? <laughs> That's a gray area, they may say. But look, the Bible says nothing, no food, will either commend you. So kahit anong kainin, pwedeng kainin, hindi kasalanan nyo, kasalanan lang yun. Pag kain-kain ka ng cake na mataas na yung sugar mo, parang ako. Yun, kasalanan yun. Kasi I'm not taking care of my body. But you see, you see, you see how people misconstrued and twist biblical truth to suit their own concept and need. And not only that, they dictate that to you. Sinasabi sa akin, uy, ba't kakain naman kain ng diniguan? Sabi ko, bakit? Sira ba itong diniguan na ito? Akala ko sira, kinakain ko diniguan. Hindi, bawal yan. I go, why? Hindi, because the Bible says you do not eat anything with blood. I mean, totally. 
totally misinformed. But what did I do? What did I say? Sinari ka ba? Ang hina mo naman. Hindi yan. Mali yan. Did I say that? Of course not. I said, okay, if you feel that this is something that we should not eat, then next time siguro I will not eat dinuguan with you. Because I don't want to really, you know. But of course, I had to teach him of the truth, what is in the Bible. Because that is what it is important. That's why, look, it says here, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So the thing that we need to avoid is searing the conscience of people. By the way, what's conscience? What's conscience? That's in Tagalog, in English, conscience. What is that? Anybody? Anybody? Conscience. Well, let me share to you a very nice definition of what conscience is. Conscience is the voice of a Christian's conscience, meaning it's an instrument of the Holy Spirit. If a believer's conscience is weak, it is because he is spiritually weak and immature. Meaning, the more, the more immature your conscience is, the more, the more it cannot take all of these things, the more it believes that your foundation is weak. Conscience is the doorkeeper to keep us out of place where we could be harmed. As we mature, conscience allows us to go to more places and do more things because we will be, have more spiritual strength and have better spiritual judgment. Give you an example on how to put this. You know, when I was in the States, I was with my cousin who was, uh, how should I say, a child who was very energetic. Makulit, okay? And uh, we, went into, we went into a mountain tourist spot, but in that mountain tourist spot, the... the, 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 the the tour guide told us that the best view is when you go near the edge, okay? And then you look out. That's the best view because you could see everything. And so when, when I was going to the, the, to the hilltop, to the mountain top, I noticed that my cousin, who was major energetic, was with me. I knew in my head, my conscience was already telling me, if you go to the edge of the cliff, sasama yung pinsan mo na yan, Right? For sure, he will go. And so here's the concept of foregoing your rights. It was my right to see that wonderful spot. I am a tourist for crying out loud. I paid for this trip. Right? That was my right to go there. But because of my love for my cousin, of course, I will not risk it. I will not go here for the point of watching it and seeing it and then ruin the life of my cousin. It's the same principle when it comes to spiritual walk. We don't want to do things because our conscience flags us. We already know when you are in doubt, don't do it. And that is the proper way to understand how it is to become a protector because God uses us to protect one another. This is why he says, everybody, can you read this with me? Verse 9, but take care of this liberty of yours does not somehow become what? A stumbling block. What is a stumbling block? Anybody? What is a stumbling block? A stumbling block, if you're going to take a picture, is something like this. This is a stumbling block. A stumbling block is, some, is, a, is a block in the road that keeps you from passing. In terms of spiritual context, a stumbling block limits you, a person. If you become a stumbling block, you, 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 be, you become a hindrance to someone's personal growth, personal faith. At times, the worst case of a stumbling block is that you lead that person into sin. Yan po yung ibig sabihin ng stumbling block. Which is why their conduct is not governed by their knowledge, but rather, it should be governed by their love. Kasi pag mahal mo yung isang tao, at yung isang tao na yun, gusto mo talaga lumari mga pananampalataya, at gusto mo makilala ang Panginoon, you will not be in the way. But unfortunately, some of us, some of us, in our sincerity, sometimes, even in our sincere desire to help, we are becoming a hindrance to some people. And so we need to pray that we do not become a stumbling block. And look at how, Paul's, look at how Paul placed this, being a stumbling block. Look, amazingly, look, look at this. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, uh, sabi niya? I will what? Never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Notice how Paul concluded it. He did not say I will only drink a small... Kukurot lang ako. Di po niya sinabi yun. Or I won't eat na lang pag nandiyan ka, ha? 
Hindi niya sinabi yan. He said, I will not eat at all. Never. Why? Because he needs to understand. He wants to tell this weaker brother that this is what grace is. What is grace? Grace is you're willing to forego something in order for that person to grow in maturity and love for the Lord. Yun pong ibig sabihin when he says, you will not cause anyone to stumble. You are going to forego your right. And you know why Paul was able to do this? Can I say to you why Paul was able to do this? Because look, it's no longer him. He was crucified with Christ. It is Christ who lives in Paul. This life I now live in the body I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So if you're here, like me, and I'm a firm, and I'm a firm believer that I am a follower of Christ and that he lives in me. And so when I forgo my rights, it's actually Christ's rights in me that I'm forgoing, not myself. And that softens the cushion. That softens the impact, which leads us to the application question for that, which is this. What do you need to focus more on following Jesus? Or do you need to focus more on following Jesus than what others are doing? Than focusing on what others are doing. What are some of the things others can, but you may choose not to do for the sake of protecting others' conscience? Is there something you need to change? Sadly, in our church today, more people are concerned on what other people are doing rather than what they are doing. Unfortunately, in the church today, more people are looking what others are committing their mistake but they are not looking at the mistakes that they do. It's sad to realize that we're so enamored in looking at how people should change, but not focus anything about the things that we need to change. I submit to you, if we're all looking intrusively first, check me first, correct me first, transform me first, you know what's going to happen? Your testimony your life, your impact to your family, to your wife, to your husband, to your community, to your friends, to your D group, to your church, all of that will follow. Why? Because when they see you foregoing your rights, being transformed, following the gospel, living it out, when they see that in you, they want to follow that as well. And that is our prayer, that how we will be encouraging to one another. And that's why when we surrender our rights, we build others up. That's why when we surrender our rights, we protect other people. And when we surrender our hearts, we don't what? We do it for the gospel. The entire chapter 9 speaks about the gospel. And the gospel is being pushed by Paul by telling the people in Corinth, Hey, look at me. Model me. Imitate me. And the imitation that Paul was telling and pointing to himself was the imitation of foregoing his rights. Forgoing his rights. Look, look at, look, at how, look at how chapter 9 starts. Four questions. Four questions in chapter 9 that really speaks of the right of Paul to demand his right. Look, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If, if to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. All of those questions are answerable by yes. He, he has that right. And then he segued and followed it up. Do I have not the right to eat, to drink, to take a wife, to refrain from working? He starts off this, a series of questions, which reasserts his right as an apostle to be supported. right? And then, after he's questioning that, he rattles off with an argument of example. Look at the example of the word, world. Aren't they supporting the people that he supported them. Check it out. Look, who at any time serves a soldier in his own expense? Who plants in the vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? The point here is that he highlighted the soldier, the farmer, and the shepherd. All three are fed and sustained by their own work as a proof that Paul should be supported as well. But you know, here's the caveat. He will rattle up all of these verses to tell people you need to do this for me. But at the end said, of course, but I'm not going to ask you to do that to me. 
because that is what he will forego. He's rest to all of this. Why? Because he wants them to he wants to point people to them. Look at verse 9. You shall not muzzle the ox. What is a muzzle the ox? What was that? Muzzle. Busal. I had to ask that in Tagalog at 3 p.m. Sabi ko, ano bang Tagalog ng muzzle? Busal. Okay. Ang Tagalog ng ox? Ox. Then, then, well, hindi ko rin po alam. But what's, what's the concept of muzzling the ox? Here's the concept. Here's the picture. It's foolish. What Paul is saying, is foolish to muzzle the ox. It, the ox, okay, is in this is what you call a threshing floor. Threshing floor. The ox go around pounding the wheat so that it could get all this this food, this, the result of which is getting more wheat, okay? So, ang sabi ni Paul, it's foolish for you to put a busal, a busal, a, 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 a muzzle in the ox. Why? Because that will make the ox what? Pag di mo pinapakayan yung ox, pag di mo pinipigyan ng tubig, pag pinapahirap mo huminga, ano mangyayari sa ox? Ox, ox today, ox. What will happen to the ox? Mamatay, manghihina. And that is what Paul is saying. If you are not going to support me, how can I do my work? That is, what his, that is his argument. In fact, he even pushes for more. Not only have that, do I have not the right over you? But look, everyone look, 11 verses to point to this point. And what is that point in verse 12? Everybody read this with me. Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endured all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. What Paul is saying, I deserve to do all of this. I can demand to do all of this, but I'm going to go forego it. I'm going to endure it. Endure it for what? For the what? For the gospel of Christ. This word endure is such an amazing word. Endure, stego. Stego, in, in, in its original word, is the word stego, the word endure. That means it's, it's like a roof on top. Stego is like Stego is like a, a bunker. That anything that you put in the bunker, it will be protected. So the word endure all things means Paul is willing to take the hit. To take the hit so that the gospel can be proclaimed. Meaning, he can be embarrassed, he can be rejected, he can be put in a situation that is shameful, he can be slandered, he can be said wrong things, all of that. But he is willing. Why is he willing? Because he is willing to protect. He is willing to endure. For what? For the gospel. And that's why he says in verse 15, But I have used none of these things. None. None of these things. And I write these things so that it will not be done in my case. For it would be better for me to die than to have any man make both an empty one. What Paul is saying I'm not saying that. Hindi, hindi, ano, ano sa Tagalog to? Hindi nagpaparinig. Hindi siya nagpaparinig para ibigay sa kanya to. Sinasabi na to kasi ito yung mga ifo for go na rights niya. Ito yung mga rights na ibibigay niya, ibibigay niya. Why? Because, again, it's for the gospel. I have seven verses left. And these seven verses, I need to finish in five minutes. Okay? And so these seven verses, what I want to do, is that I'm going to crap it in. These are the seven verses from verse 14 to verse 23. Actually, more than seven verses. That's eight verses, okay? But I wanted to highlight some key things. When you look at this, the word gospel is mentioned seven times. Seven times in eight verses. In fact, if you would stretch the sample size from verse 12 to verse 23, the word gospel is mentioned 12 times. So clearly, this part of the chapter talks about the gospel and the importance because all of what Paul is trying to argue, to defend unto this point is about the gospel. But here's another thing that I want you to notice. The word gospel is mentioned seven times, but the word I may win more is mentioned five times. Now it's becoming to give you a clearer picture of what these verses are all about. It's the gospel and Paul's desire so that people may win people to the gospel. And then the third thing that I want you to notice in these seven verses is the word preach. And the word preach is mentioned three times. So gospel, 
so that you may win people, and the way to you, for you to win people is to what? To preach, to share the word. And this is what I'm doing now, sharing the word to you, sharing the gospel to you. Why do I say this? Because this role is your role. Your role is to share the gospel. And one way to share the gospel is to invite people to church. We're blessed that we're gaining a little bit. Nung nagsimula po kami ng Vesper, mga 60, 70 lang po kami. Ngayon pinata nasa 100 na tayo. So tumataas ng konti. But marami pa pong mga bakanting upuan, no? Marami pa. So we could meet more people. We could invite more people. And that's the reason why we're challenging the community at our church to be really out, outward-centric, looking outside on what they can do. And also, look, Gospel was mentioned seven times. The word may win was mentioned five times. The word preach was mentioned three times. But look at this, look at this. The fifth, the fifth I may win, I may win, look, uh, in verse 23, verse 22, it was changed to I will save some. So from the concept of I may to win, so it gives you an idea. For us to win, for Paul to win, people needs to be saved. So gospel may win, preaching, saved. And that is really what it means. That when you surrender your rights, you need to do it for the gospel. That's why in verse 21, Paul says, For though I am a free for, from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may what? Win more. Though he is free, he is willing to give up his rights so that we can win more people to Christ. Folks, within what I have been discussing for the past 50 minutes, my prayer is this. I hope what, what you realize that yes, doctrine counts. Yes, knowledge is right. Yes, connection is okay. But the heart and the life to bear the brand of Jesus is love. That has to be there. It has to cost you something to follow Jesus. And that cost of something to follow Jesus is to exude that love first to God and then love to other people. That's why he says, I have become all things to all men so that I may be all means save some. You need to become all things to all men. What does that mean? How do we practicalize that? Paano po magiging all things to all men? Paano yan? Give me an idea. Let me give you an idea. Some of you, kailangan po maging grab driver ng mga kamag-anak nyo. Sunduin nyo, dalin nyo po sa simbahan. That's number one. Marami, actually, in any order po to. Number two, sa iba sa inyo, kailangan maging mas galante. May naman mas galante. Galante sa oras, galante sa pagkain. Reach out to more people. Pangatlo, the way to really become all things to men is dapat mga iba sa atin, kapalan natin ang mga mukha natin. Ano yung ibig sabihin na kapalan ng mukha natin? That means, kapalan natin ang mukha natin because masyara tayo naapektuhan pag nag-invite tayo at nag-hindi. Ah, ayaw mo ah. Wala na, hindi na ka tayo invitahin. Kailangan natin kapalan ng mukha natin kahit ilang beses tayo nare-reject. Mag-invite pa rin po tayo sa simbahan, sa, 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 sa D-group. Mag-text ka pa rin kahit yung hindi umatin yung D-group downline mo. Text mo na yung text yan, umaten ka. Sige, sisiput ako, pero di pa pakita. Kapala mo yung mukha mo, atin ka ulit. Ganun eh. You have, to, you have to become all things to all men. Why? So that you may save some. Look at what Paul said. I'm doing all, but I'm only gonna save some. I'm doing all, but I'm gonna save some. Why? Because we're not supposed to save everyone. There are only a few people. By the way, there are studies shown that for every four people invite in church, only one will show up. So invite 40 so that 10 will show up. That's how you do the math. I have become all things to men, so that I may be all things means to some. Folks, but before I end, I need, to let you sh- I need to share to you something that's very strong in my heart. Yes, we need to be all things to all men. But that doesn't mean that when you become all things to all men, that means you're going to water down your walk in Christ. A lot of people, they invite people to church, but they tell them the wrong things. They tell them, Punta ka sa church, mga wala lahat problema mo. Punta ka sa simbahan, lahat ng, lahat ng mga problema mo, masusolusyonan yan. I mean, that's not, that's watering it down. 
You invite them to church and tell them, you know what? Magkakaproblema ka pa rin because problema is part of life. But you know what? When you have those problems and you have Christ with you, something amazing happens. You become more strong. You become more resilient in Christ. And by the way, sometimes Christ gives us a bonus that what we pray for, He provides. But that is the concept. We are not going to water down the gospel. The gospel is not all blessings. Yes, there's a blessing for eternal relationship, but the gospel is also hard because it means that you will have to give up your life. You need to surrender your life, and you need to understand that you need a Savior because we are all sinners, and the concept of rebellion has to be part of the gospel. We need to re- not rebellion, repentance. We need to repent because we're all sinners, and so you don't water down the gospel. Paul did not water down the gospel. He never compromised the doctrines of Christ. He never sinned against the dictates of God's law for the conscience of evangelism. And that is also what we want to say. That yes, we can be all things to all men, but that doesn't mean that you become a sinner for that person because you want to woo them into Christ. Let me ask you this final application question. Have you experienced the gospel in such a way that no price is too great to pay for you to partake in it? That is to be experienced the supreme blessing of bringing the gospel to people for Jesus. Have you had that privilege of bringing someone? I invite you. Nothing is so extraordinary than seeing you being used by the Lord to transform people's lives for His glory. That's why here's the closing challenge of Paul in verse 23. The closing challenge of Paul is this. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become what? A partaker, a fellow partaker. You know what's a fellow partaker? A fellow partaker is, is someone that you do not want to possess it alone. Ayaw mong solohin. Gusto mong ibigay. Mga kapatid, kapag umatin po kayo ng simbahan, naniniwala po kayong nasa, nasa puso niyo si Jesus. Ibig sabihin, naniniwala po kayo sa Ebanghelyo. That means you're believing in the gospel. But some of us, even though we believe in the gospel, we keep this. We keep it in ourselves. We don't bring it out. We don't give it to people. We don't share the gospel. We don't invite. We keep it to ourselves. Paul is saying, no, you have to be a fellow partaker of it. You need to go out. You need to share the gospel. You need to reach out for the people. You need to invite. You need to bring them into church, into small groups. Why? Because that's when the true blessing of the gospel happens. When you partake of the gospel. You live it out. You share it. But you also partake of it. And folks, the best way to live it out is to surrender your right. Because when you surrender your right, you build others up, you protect others, and you what? You know what? You do it for the gospel. Again, as I close, chapter 9, the entire chapter 9 is giving up the rights. Paul, Paul is the epitome of giving up the rights according to chapter 9. But can I share to you that there is one far more greater model that gave up his rights for you and I? And who is that? Jesus. In fact, he is the gospel. And the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, is the gospel. And that's why tonight, remember the element that we shared to you at the start? Okay? We're going to talk about this now. You see, the Last Supper, as we end our service tonight, the the celebration of the Lord's Supper is not just a tradition. It's biblical. If you don't have it, if you don't have the elements, our ushers can give you. For those of you who perhaps came in late, you might not have it. But you need to have this as we close our time today with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. There is a biblical basis for what we, why we do, why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And can I get your attention and fix your eyes on the screen as we read verse 23 to 25 of the first book of Corinthians chapter 11. Can you, I've been speaking since 10 in the morning. So can you help me read these three verses, please? One, two, three, go. Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, okay, stop, stop. The bread, took the bread, 
And then he said that this is a remembrance of my body. Okay? You see, the reason we celebrate the Lord's Supper is not because of tradition. We celebrate the Lord's Supper because we recall the gospel. We are reminded of what Christ has done. And so when he said that this bread is my body and do this in remembrance of me, that means we need to remember the sacrifice of Christ. When he paid the penalty and the payment for our sins by his body, by giving the right to his body, to his body to be punished, to his body to be humiliated, to, to, to his body to be, to be nailed on the cross as the worst expression of death during that time. That is what it means when you remember the body. That is what we mean by when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Because that is the ultimate gift that He has given us. His body, His sacrifice. And because of His sacrifice, and because of His body, what has happened? Everybody, verse 25. In the same way, He took the cup, also after supper, saying what? This cup is the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. What is a new covenant? The gospel speaks of the new covenant. What is the new covenant? The new covenant is this. Before, we were living in a law, in a salvation by law. Okay? But now we're living by the law of grace. That is the new covenant. The new covenant. Now, before, you will have to follow the law. Now, you are saved by grace. And that is the new covenant, meaning Jesus Christ's death has paved the way for the payment of our sins that allowed us to have eternal life. And that is the ultimate gift. And that's why it's called the good news. And more than that, after remembering the body, by remembering the blood, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, it also means that we proclaim that the Lord's death until He comes. It's a statement of faith that we believe that, we believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back and we establish His kingdom here and reign with His people. And that's what it means to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And that's what it means that we need to have the gospel of Christ in our lives. But before we partake of the elements, there is one final command, a warning in the scriptures. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. What is an unworthy manner? What is an unworthy manner? An unworthy manner is this. An unworthy manner is that you will partake of this but you don't actually believe in what God has done. You don't believe that His death paved the way for our salvation. You don't believe that the blood has this new covenant. So in short, you do not believe in the gospel. So it's okay if you are here and you're not ready because you are not yet a believer of that. It's okay. But I will be remiss if I will not invite you tonight as we close to invite you to surrender your life to Christ. Because how can we ask you to surrender your rights when you haven't surrendered your life to Him? It is but fitting, but it's but proper that as we close our message today about surrendering our rights, we know that we have already surrendered our life. But if you're here and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, the Lord brought you here because He wants you to have this opportunity to surrender and accept Him as your Lord and Savior tonight. So before we partake of the elements, would it be okay if we close our eyes, we bow our heads, and we just pray, especially to those of us who are here who are not yet sure, who have not yet really f- committed, fully committed their life to the Lord. You have never surrendered your life to the Lord. Tonight, the Lord is inviting you to do that, to surrender your life to Him. So if that is you, this act of surrender is an act of repentance and an act of, of belief. Repentance, belief, and acceptance. So let me share to you a prayer that you might follow in your heart that can lead you to surrendering your hearts to Jesus. Follow me in this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you. I admit I am a sinner and I want to repent for all of the things that I have done. Tonight, I believe that you died in the cross. I believe that you resurrected from the death and I believe that because of your resurrection, you have paid the penalty of my sins. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and change me 
and make me the person you want me to be. Lord Jesus, I don't know who prayed that prayer, but you do. And as we end our time today in prayer, let us open the bread. And now let us partake of the bread, remembering the sacrifice that he has done, that paid the way for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's partake of the bread. Let's open the juice and be reminded of the blood of Christ that paved the way for the new covenant. And this new covenant takes place when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Now when we have him in our hearts, we mean to say that we believe in the finished work that he has done on the cross, the sacrifice that paved the way for this new covenant, the covenant of grace to happen in our lives. Let's partake of the juice. And let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your reminder to all of us that for us to truly experience more of you in our lives, it means less of us. And that means we need to surrender more of you, more to you. Tonight, I pray that this message has spoken to us about how we behave, how we do things, how we do things out of our desire to love you more and to love the people around us. So please continue to guide your people, continue to guide your church, and help us to really build other people up. Help us also in our actions to protect other people by surrendering more of our rights to you and more of our hearts. And lastly, we pray that as we surrender our hearts and our rights to you, may it be a means for us to share more of the gospel and to become fellow partakers of it. We thank you and we praise you as we lift up to you, Lord, all of these things. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. God bless you, everyone. Good night. See you next Sunday. Amen and amen. Can we invite everyone to stand?